Welcome to the big show. Today we're going to talk about why service advisors get objections from customers. Why do service advisors get objections? Pretty good list and conversation. You're going to take a, a lot away from that. Also, uh, why we won't be at NADA, I guess, kind of, sort of. In a roundabout way, yeah, probably. And uh, some fun stuff in the news and much, much more coming up on this edition of Service Drive Revolution! How's it going, Chris John? Great, thank you very much. How are you? What's new in the zoo? Lots of things, but I do think I, I uh, usually at this time of year I get a little bit guilty. I feel a little bit guilty because, like, for instance, right now it's raining and kind of yucky looking outside. And then I complain to people that live in Chicago and Cincinnati <laughs> and New York about, like, how, how much I despise the 60 degrees and rain. <laughs> and they had to use a snowblower to get to work today. So uh, it's kind of that weird, weird point in the year. But there's also... What's going on on your side? I like I like it because there's no traffic. Everybody stays home. Oh yeah, it's like a snow day. They're afraid of uh, they're afraid of driving in in wet. Yeah, it's a uh, very interesting. People in LA are also very worried about like walking around without umbrellas and like the the rain is going to kill them, which it may. Most people don't have umbrellas. Oh, I saw a lot of umbrellas this morning on my way to work. But yeah, it's good. It's also uh, another time of year, right? A time where you get asked a specific question. What's that? Well, I get this question asked for you, and then I think that you also get this asked. Is it good? A, I don't know what the question is, but is it good that I'm sheltered from it? No, I think they get to you anyway. So it's just more happen than you know of. But um, will you be at NADA this year? <laughs> no. <laughs> Did something change? <laughs> Did NADA all of a sudden become effective? Oh no, <laughs> no. I was <laughs> I was gonna mess with you and say that the question that I really get asked all the time is, "What are your plans for Groundhog's Day?" Are you gonna, is it a big event or no? No, not at all. Groundhog's Day. Yeah, February second. Oh. One of the most um, probably ridiculous holidays in the United States. Isn't is that Groundhog's an East Day. Coast thing? Yeah. Yeah. Nobody here is not worried about that. Started in uh, Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, I believe. That's where that little it's a great movie badger thing. It is a pretty good movie. There's a lot of lessons in that movie. But uh, so no, no NADA appearance for you. What uh, what would it take to get me to speak at NADA? Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, you know they don't pay, right? I do. So I don't need practice speaking. That's fair. Um, second of all, they would just they would have to be more about the truth, like not propaganda. Like I don't know. It's just I feel like uh, they they play no role. They're an event uh, that it, it's a for profit event. Mm. They're not, there's no, they're not tied to any outcome. They don't have to be effective. It's like how many, uh, how many 20 groups? Have you ever heard anybody say, Hey, I went to an NADA 20 group and my dealership in the two years I've been in it doubled their net profit. Have you ever heard anybody say anything like that? No, no. Cause they don't grade themselves on outcomes. We might be one of the only companies out there that grade ourselves on outcomes. Yeah, that net profit thing's really important. It's a harder path. Yeah. Right? You could come up with a bunch of reasons that that shouldn't be the grading scale, but that's not true. So you think that if NADA got really serious about you know the future and results and everything like that, they I do think it's a potential to be a good platform. Well, if you had a good leader at NADA, you would get the dealers together. You would lobby effectively. You would... Um, you you also would you would be working with the manufacturers and the dealers helping navigate the changes but i mean that just doesn't happen like you know i would imagine nada is a lot like the la car show 
half of what it was. Like oh, because uh, less and less representation. Well, I know their attendance has been down, right? But I would imagine it probably will keep declining. Like I, I know most dealers will say will see it as like my people just get a trip. Mm. And especially when they have it in Vegas or whatever, most people are out partying. They're not go. They're not. They're not getting anything out of it. Like. Yeah, I think that uh, I think that there is a place where what you just said makes a whole bunch of sense. Is like, is there a world where we can play offense, not defense, on this? And I love the idea of bringing the manufacturers and the dealers together. Any and, uh, DA is vendor on vendor crime is what it is. It's a for profit event that they're charging vendors to be there. They you know they have workshops, but I don't I don't think many of the workshops are really effective. Like there'll be some good ones probably, but for the most part, they're pretty, pretty ineffective. Like, mm. but yeah, you I get agree. to, you get to see the latest, you know, alignment machine or CRM or whatever. I don't know. So it's not enough to get me to leave home. Okay. I've never been, so I don't know if I can give a really, really good uh, viewpoint of it, but I do think that there's an opportunity there. I feel like it could be good. It just would take a lot of different than what it is right now. Oh, it reminds me, speaking of uh, speaking of nothing related to this, I heard a funny joke. Ready for it? How do you measure a millennial? How? In Instagrams. <laughs> That's pretty good. It is it is funny that the my last confrontation with NADA when they told me I couldn't talk about Tesla, how much of what I said was going to happen happened. Oh, I believe that. Like it's just funny. Was that a decade they ago? Said, uh, it's not popular with the dealers when I asked them why. They were telling me not to talk about it. I don't even know if they know that's true or not. I just don't think at the end of the day, I don't think that I fit into those sort of corporate I don't fit into a thing where we can't have a conversation about what's really going on. That it's a narrative, not a conversation. Mm. I'd, ex I'd accept it that. It feels like communism to me. Like, I always feel that way. Like, when you can't talk about certain things that are the elephant in the room, it, uh, I don't know. It's not for me. Mm. Yeah, that's good. You want to, I remember uh, one of the first things that you told me is you don't like small talk. And that might be just an event with I hate small talk. Yeah. I mean, there's too much small talk there. what do you think of the master class we just had here? So we had a uh, 16 people or something. Yeah, it was really 15 or 16, but yeah, it was really close to that. Uh, for the master class, which is new clients coming into our coaching, kind of come for two days and we kind of go through the process and then the plan for the next 90 days. It's kind of the kickoff. High level of engagement is what I would say. So the way that we went through the material, they picked up a lot of things, asked a lot of questions. Um, I thought Coach Peter and uh, Coach Chris Hoagland did a great job with their facilitating. Uh, so we had three people giving um, giving information to the clients, which I think is actually good because you never know where the where the info is coming from. So you got to pay closer attention, but. They uh, they were ready to go is what I got. And I you know what I don't know if that's like a like a gym membership thing or what it is, but it seems like at the beginning of the year, whenever I do a master class, they're ready to go. Like this was a this is a good time to come into the thing because it's like you, you see their trajectory for this year and you understand that if you do it the way you did it last year, you won't have any better results. So they were really committed to trying to learn something new. But I would say that everybody walked out with a very different viewpoint. I, I, uh, I really like how the library plays into that. I feel like this is very functional for meetings and. Well, it's really, I mean, frankly, it's four different things. So it's a library, it's a meeting spot, um, it's a studio, and then it's also, uh, also just like a regular social event place. So there's maybe well, we have a more. kitchen because it's kind of a commercial kitchen. Yeah. So we can feed them. That's the other cool thing is I really do like the dinner that we do at the end of night one. 
yeah. we had a chef come in and really trying to create an experience. And I think that that's the thing about masterclass is that when you come in, what you're experiencing is not unlike what you should go back and kind of blueprint into your store, right? In a high level of detail, um, telling the truth about things and really breaking things down into a way that you can affect change. Yeah. I also think what's cool about it is it, it, uh, we can create a better experience and it cost us less. Like if we took everybody out to dinner, we wouldn't be able to control the experience or the food or whatever. And having a chef come in, we pick the menu, they eat here, the whole thing. Like we've created a scenario where we can control the, the environment and the outcome in a positive way. Yeah, there's 0% chance of bad service. And then I also played some records and they, they were did. pretty blown away. What was, the, uh, what was the top record this year or this month where everybody's like, oh, that's different or that's amazing? Um, probably the Led Zeppelin. That's what I that always, a whole lot of love always like get some. I the way the separation, like you just never heard it like that yeah. before. I think that one's like transformational and then Hotel California. You know what I loved about this group? A lot of them were from the Midwest? No. Oh. There's nothing wrong with that, but no. No. Okay. Nobody wanted to hear Tool. <laughs> <laughs> no Tool? <laughs> That's always the request is Tool. That's funny. Tool to me is like Rush. It's math. Oh, yeah. That's a Because being good a point. drummer, like I, I just, uh, it's just odd time signatures and it feels like math. And I know it's good. I, I understand that it's hard, but it isn't, it doesn't feel like music to me. It feels like math. Mm -hmm. Okay. If that makes any sense. Yeah, I don't know as much about music as you do, so I can enjoy Tool. But uh, but I, I always want to hear anyone. Tool through the system. Mm, I don't know. I'd still give that. I'd choose that Zeppelin any day. Oh, Dark Side of the Moon's pretty cool too. But definitely, you want to get classic rock on this system, and then country. <laughs> what do you want? You want to talk about the news? Yeah. So one of these you sent to me and then the other two. You have that one in there? Yeah. What did you think of that? Oh, I guess you got to tell everybody what it is first. Yeah. So let's do that first. Um, so Toyota just announced that it's creating an ultra luxury brand above Lexus. So think about like um, Maybach is what I was when you sent this to me and I read through it. I was like, oh, okay. So it's like Ben's doing Maybach. But uh, they're going to have a luxury brand above Lexus and it's called Century. And so I can't show you, maybe Kevin can put the inlay in, but essentially there's a, they, they're starting with an SUV that is going to top out at about $220,000. And if you look at it, it looks a lot like the Rolls Royce SUV, if you've seen that thing. So they're, uh, they're dipping their toe in that pool, but uh, um, it debuted in uh, September of last year. And it's a... Uh, and they haven't decided if they're it going to. debuted where? Uh, Europe. Oh, really? Yep. So they, they haven't confirmed it, that it's going to come to the U.S. Oh, wow. But yeah, so that's uh, it's on the horizon for Toyota. But um, you yes. wouldn't believe how many people in my, in, you know, Beverly Hills or my neighborhood in Hollywood drive half a million dollar cars. Like, it's nuts. Yeah, you know what? Actually, uh, um, kind of a cousin of that, I didn't print that, but uh, I saw it while I was looking at all this stuff, is that you know who had uh, their best year ever last year? Which supports what you just said. Bentley? Lamborghini. Yeah. The most Lamborghini sold ever was last year. It's crazy. So there's a lot of people that can afford $500,000 cars. It's pretty crazy. But yeah, so they're gonna they're going into the. Well, if you could luxury. afford one, would you have one? No. Yeah, that's the thing. I don't know necessarily that it's about affording because, like, you know, you can lease a Ferrari, like for, I think on the low end for thirty five hundred a month or something. You could lease one, so, I mean, that's a lot, but. Yeah, but by the time you use it as a business write off, it's not near as much as you might think. Yeah, but would you like? It's just not a practical. I think about it as uh, as no matter what, no matter how much I do really like cars, it's not an investment. <laughs> like if you have that much money, you could be making it work for you. Yeah. 
So that's probably why I don't um, I agree with that. Yeah, I've got a level where no matter how successful I am, I think that I probably won't hit past a certain Same. amount. Uh, like I, I don't mind having a nice car. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't. Yeah, deny but that two hundred twenty thousand is a, w more than I would do. Yeah, because you could, like I said, you could turn two hundred twenty thousand into four hundred thousand if you play your cards right. So that is my uh, that's my thought on that. Okay, so speaking of cars, um, this was uh, off of Cox Automotive's report that used vehicle supply closed twenty twenty three at the highest levels of the year. So. Again, pay attention if you're in the service department. Um, so I think that that's really interesting. So used vehicle inventory rose to 2.39 million units, which is a 56-day supply, so almost two months. So that tells me, right, when you're thinking about February and March in terms of the, uh, the service department is I would expect to have less internals because they're going to try to clean out that inventory first. Um, so that's, uh, that's something that everybody should kind of be paying attention to. But the levels of, of, you know, inventory keep going up. I would also suspect it doesn't say this on this report, but um, I'd love to know the percentage of dealers that are underwater on those cars. Remember how it had that huge bubble and it's starting to correct? Well, they're going to be underwater just in the sense that they're going to go down in value quicker. We're going to see a, you know, a depreciation because the new car supply is there, right? So yeah. Used cars had a, I remember I, during, uh, I don't know, was it 2022? I sold the car I had for oh, more than I paid for yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, which made no sense. That may never happen again as long as you live. But people bought it for more than I paid for it, and they now are in it for more than I paid for it, right? Yeah. And that car isn't going to be worth that. It's going to go back to the old value i would suspect that it's already kind of gone back there yeah so they've already kind of lost that money so everybody's trying to na navigate that negative equity yeah so the good side for the for the service departments is that people will have to keep their cars longer they're gonna have to fix them mm -hmm. and some of these cars that people bought they're underwater on and they do break over time so there's there's some reason for them to uh to do that. And then the last thing is just kind of funny. I'm just curious to hear what your take is on it because I feel like it's completely senseless. Volkswagen's announced that it's putting chat GPT on their cars. I think uh, Mercedes is doing that first, right? Yeah, I don't remember if they used chat GPT or if it was a different kind of AI system, but Volkswagen's hopped on that bandwagon. Okay, what's the, the headline for this subject? Hmm, how do we want to put this? So I would say it is... Let's talk about the service advisor's job after getting an objection or why service advisors get objections from customers. How's that sound? Better? Okay, so I have, I have a theory about things. And when I say this theory, it's going to have the Chris Collins effect. People are going to be like, no, no, yeah, that's too much. Blah, my head hurts. Whatever. Uh, but... It doesn't mean it's not true. Yeah. So I think all lost sales can be traced to a mistake made earlier in the process. I might be able to come up with like one example where it wouldn't be a mistake necessarily. Okay. Tell but me. I don't know. If someone comes in with a check engine light, there's no other things going on with their car and it needs a new engine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, there are. Yeah. But for the most part. It's a good rule. Yeah. It, you're better if you live by it. Yes. Yeah, the, um, don't run, it's don't not run absolute. with the exception. It's not absolute. Yeah. Okay, so when we're talking about service advisors and objections, most of the time what happens is we want scripts. You're like, just tell me what to say. But the problem with telling somebody what to say or giving them a script is most of communication with people is nonverbal. And then it's tonality, it's authenticity, it's believability, like it's all of it's all of that also. And so having a script in a sense uh, is missing the 80% of what communication really is. Well, and frankly, what gets someone to say yes is the human part of it is probably what you would say. Um, yeah, I, I'm not uh, I'm not a huge fan of the script when it comes to that stuff. I would also say that at least from my conversations with, with dealers and managers and advisors is their belief is that when you get the objection is like time to go to work, 
but the time to go to work was before that, right? The other thing um, I think that most most of us think is that it's product knowledge. And product knowledge doesn't hurt in a sense, but I sold a lot of work as an advisor and had no clue about the product in a sense, right? So I, I believe just because of my personal experience that product knowledge is good, but it's not, it's not the end all be all either communication is. And so the, you know, most of the time when we're getting an objection, what the customer is saying in a sense is I don't, you know, I don't trust or I don't believe you. Right. Um, and so the thing to, to focus on more than anything is the trust and the, the frame of being, a friend and being a pattern interrupt, being different than anybody else they've ever interacted with. Right. And so that is established at the, at the very first contact. So if a customer comes in and they got to go find you and then you're on the phone and you're indifferent, or the first thing you say to them is, you know, do you have an appointment? And all you do is talk about the car and there's nothing personal in the interaction, then you pretty much now are in the frame of who can do it cheaper and faster because you're just a commodity. There's no personal relationship involved, right? And so um, understanding what frame you're in is probably the most important part. And then, you know, treating them like a friend or a family member and talking to them about the things that matter, like work, kids, life, goals, ambition, you know, all of that sort of stuff is way more important than the vehicle. Mm -hmm. Cause when it comes time to talk about the vehicle, when you're a trusted friend, you're helping them navigate how to get it done. Even if they don't have the money at the time, like when I was an advisor, I don't remember how many times I just set out a plan for somebody. They, it, they you know, yeah, weren't you, I think I remember you telling me a story, you would work their visits around payday and stuff like that. Do you remember telling me that? Oh, like yeah. Like, you'd be like, so you would have, if there's a, let's just say $2,000 worth of work. And I remember you telling me that you would have someone come in on a Sunday or Saturday or whatever it was, and you're like, hey, you guys need $2,000 worth of work. And they're like, I don't have the money for that, but I get paid every two weeks and all that stuff. And you would set, like, appointments that day for two weeks down the road, four weeks down the road and six weeks down the road. I remember you telling me that story. And it's like every time they got paid, then they had a little bit of money to kind of break through. And essentially they're getting their two grand done in a, in a way that was manageable to their pay. Yeah. And that's because they saw me as a friend helping them. Yeah. And like, that's what a friend would do. Yeah. The, the next thing I think in that that is important is I never put myself in a position to get a no. You will have to unpack that for everybody. Well, just do you want to do your breaks? Yes. Well, say no. No, no. Now what do I do? Argue with you? Like to me, overcoming objections was like, oh, am I, am I debating a customer? Am I arguing? Like they said, no, it's final. Like if I say no to somebody, it's fine. You're not going to – like you're just annoying me at that point. So I would never – put myself in a situation to get a yes or no. Okay. Like even in, in our advisor training, the table of contents, it is designed in a way that isn't a yes or no. It's an open-ended question. Right? Right. And so, oh, Christian, your breaks are down to 10%. Usually you should replace them at 15 and you're at 10. Now what's your next react? What's I'm late. Yeah. And then what are you going to say? The average customer. I need to get it done. You might say how much. Oh, yeah, fair. But I still haven't put myself in a position to get a no. Right. So at any point that I put myself in a position to get a no, now that's when we're saying like, oh, we need to overcome objections. I, I'm, I'm dealing with the objections as I go. So if I say, if you say, well, how much is it? And I'd say, um, and I always would try to pair it with something positive too. So I'd say, um, 350 bucks and I could have it done by the end of the day. And now you say 350 bucks, which isn't what you would say, but right. that's what people have in their mind. Right. 
wow, that's a lot of money. Can I get that done cheaper somewhere else? Uh, maybe, but why would you cheat on me? <laughs> right? That's really good. I, you know, what's funny is I, I wrote down, and maybe I, maybe I like your answer better, but I put down when you get the no, it's okay to ask why if you have permission, right? So my belief is that if you and I are friends and you tell me you don't want to get something done, it would be that I didn't do a good enough job of explaining it to you. So I would say, what is it that's making you not want to do that? But only if I'd built a relationship with you. And you're like, well, it looks like I can wait till next time or whatever it is. But I feel like the advisors that have to overcome objections are the ones that have to talk. So like, say, for example, I say, uh, oh, you know, uh, Christian, you're supposed to have your breaks done at 15%, but we haven't seen you in a while. You're down to 10. So they're really due. Yeah. That's now, just be quiet for a second. Okay. So let's say you're quiet as the customer. Now, what do most advisors do in that situation? Talk themselves out of a sale. Yeah. And so I never did that. I would, I'm okay sitting there staring at you. And then you go, well, how much is that? And I would say, well, it's 350 bucks plus tax. We can have it done by the end of the day. If you don't do them, rotors, maybe that adds another 500. Well, you know, whatever it is, maybe I might throw that in there. But then shut up. Like, shut up. <laughs> Like it, it, it's so funny how you can tell how insecure people are by the way that they have to fill silence. There is nothing wrong with silence. Silence is our friend. So I, I, I do feel like most of the time, the reason why they're in a situation where they feel like they're overcoming objections is because they've talked so much and said so much, the customer doesn't believe them and just wants to get out of there. Yeah. Like or they're their, just confused. It's their car. They need brakes. Yeah. Like, right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, the other, the other one is timing. So a lot of times when I look and call customers on declined work, like work that was declined, most of the time they didn't understand it or they were told at the end of the day. So it isn't, a, we perceive that we're losing a lot of work over objections or inability to overcome objections, but we're really, re, we're really lo losing the work because they show up to pick up the vehicle and we tell them they need the work. Yeah. And they need their car to go home or to go to school and pick up their kids or whatever it is. I mean, just think about the last time I took my car in for, uh, I had a check engine light on and, uh, what happens? Well, they sent you a video on the wrong oh, car. And it needed a lot of work. It really did. Yeah, but it wasn't my car. I could see in the video that that wasn't my car. Yeah. <laughs> That's so great that that happened. But just think about that for a second. Like, it's so disorganized. Like, we perceive that it's about overcoming objections, yeah. but it's really just about delivering it in a way that that is timely, right? That it dramatically increases your chances of adding on work to the repair order the earlier in the day you do it. Yeah, so so I think that what you're saying is that you have to um, proactively eliminate objections. So if I was calling you at 10 a.m. and I knew that the car wasn't going to be done until tomorrow, I might have a couple of options for you for yep. what you could do with substitute transportation and stuff like that. But you have to, you have, to have a lot of control over everything. The other thing I wrote down is... Uh, is Wishy Washy Walter, like that advisor that's... I love that name. <laughs> but uh, but you, a lot of you have probably seen this, is that it's that advisor that like they are worried about breaking the bad news to the customer. So they do this like, you need this if you want, and maybe you should, but you don't have to. And like they keep dancing back and forth on whether or not a customer really needs the thing that they're talking about. And it's either because they don't believe it themselves or they're not confident enough to give the information to the customer. But it goes right back to if you're talking too much, you're not selling as much. But um, say what you mean and mean what you say. Is uh, if, if you don't want to have a bunch of objections, tell the truth and tell it in a really distinct 
you know, succinct matter where there's no confusion. Because I think that the reason that customers say no to work on their cars is confusion in most cases, or they don't like or trust you. But confusion is one thing that'll make somebody say no. And, and they don't tell you I'm saying no because I'm confused because they just want to leave because they don't feel comfortable. So if it's on the paper and the and it needs to be done, you have to say that. And don't, don't impart your own belief on a job uh, just because you can or can't afford it. It's great. Um, the other one is telling a better story. Like oftentimes we're getting objections because they can't, they don't know the story like, or analogy. Right. So like, just say for example, uh, injectors, like using the analogy of it's like a shower head. And have you ever seen a shower head build up lime? That's the same thing with your injectors, right? Like that's an analogy that people, can get behind better than product knowledge oh, is yeah, the, is the analogy, sure. right? Yeah. Or just the, the story and also preempting a story. So like if I was presenting, th you know, depending on the brand, if I was an advisor and I was presenting anything over a thousand dollars, let's say Toyota store. If I was presenting any work over a thousand dollars, I probably would tell the story about how a lot of our clients use our financing option. Right. And I would tell that to everybody. Now that happens to me sometimes in scenarios where people will in the sales pitch, they'll be like, and we also have a financing option. Like, and even though I'm probably going to pay for the whole thing, I don't like financing things. I don't like having credit cards or any of that. Um, I don't have a lot of debt. It's not, you know, it's just not my thing. I don't begrudge it, but somebody who might be afraid of, oh, I can't afford it and might clam up and say, no, uh, button it up. I'm going to come pick it up. When you, when you offer another option, right? Like one of the reasons why uh, we sold so many cars when I was a general manager was we presented three options to every customer. So you, it got off a price and it was on, your, you know, here are your options. So it was like a lease payment, a finance Most people payment. are payment buyers, yep. right? And so it's the same sort of thing as if you're offering a finance option to, a, to you know, a certain dollar amount consistently, you're preempting, like a lot of those people that were coming back on payday would have taken the financing option. It wasn't available. That's what right. I'm saying is it should be way easier to sell work now than it was 20 years ago. Totally. Um, I agree with that 100%. And almost every dealership has access to that uh, those financing options. There's a bunch of different ones. I mean, manufacturers have supported credit cards. Um, you know, you got uh, like your Sunbit and there's a bunch of stuff that people could be using as resources. But there's way more ways to get somebody to, to feel like they can be comfortable comfortable in doing the work. And then you hit the nail on the head too, is that you have to present that to every customer because believe it or not, sometimes the people that take advantage of the financing are the ones that don't really need to. They just choose to, I, I'm, I'll never forget. I had this happen um, several times when I was selling cars is like people could write a check for the car, but they're like, wait a minute, if you're going to loan me, you know, $40,000 for 36 months with no interest, why wouldn't I just take it? Yeah. Finance conversion. Yeah. We so used to practice those. Yeah. So it's just, it makes a lot of sense to, to do it that way. And then your chances of on the, on a, on the sales side was you would sell a warranty if you were doing 0% financing for 48 months, always, every single time. But, uh, but on the service side, I just think that the fact that you can, uh, one, you'll, you'll roll more stuff, right? So if you, if you got somebody that needs $1,500 worth of work and maybe they need a couple of preventative maintenance items, it's easier for them to do two grand over eight months as opposed to just splitting with the 1500 and just getting what they, um, what they originally like the primary concern. So, I just think that you, I would get really familiar with any kind of alternative financing that you offer in your store. That is probably one of the number one things that you could do. And don't present it to people you think can't afford it. Present it to everybody. Yeah, it's good. So uh, the last one I, that I have is that you're probably not believable or authentic if you're getting a lot of objections. Because, I mean, if you just think about service, they need it. Like if they need breaks and they're going somewhere else for breaks, you're not likable or believable because it, they have to have them. Like it's not optional. A lot of the stuff that we, you know, there's preventative maintenance that's optional, but a lot of the stuff isn't optional. 
it's a sooner or later type of thing. Like, and so if they're not, if you get a lot of declines, you're just not likable or authentic or believable or something, but it's, you got to change your energy and the tone and whatever you're doing because you're, you're, uh, people don't trust you. Yeah. It reminds me a lot of like, imagine if you worked at a funeral parlor and couldn't sell a casket. Yeah. There you go. I mean, that's, that's extreme, but it's very on point. But it's a captive audience. You know what I just thought? I'm not sure. Do you, do you know that we get more listeners on this podcast than NADA has attendees? Think about the math for a second. It's funny. Yeah, you're right. And the idea that they don't ask us to come do that there. Like they, they don't give us a booth to do service drive revolution right in the middle of everything. It would be fun. like, think about the draw for Hunter and all of those companies that are trying to schlep their stuff. Think about that for a second. How, okay. So they, how uh, ineffective and impotent they are that the arguably the number one show in automotive, we get more downloads and I don't know anybody else that gets the downloads that we do not automotive new, like nobody. That's funny. We I, have a bigger we have a bigger draw than they do. So Isn't if they that called funny? It, if they called and offer us a booth, would we go? Uh well it depends. Like if we if we had the ability to go to NADA and do SDR in a booth and have tons of people come on and oh that'd be so fun hang out and yeah. like serve tequila and you know, see our friends. Yeah. yeah, we'd probably do that. Good. But uh think about that for a second. We might be able to help them with attendance. And think about it too. They probably only think about, they think, oh, if Chris Collins would come do a workshop, right? Because the last time I did it, I, I think we, you know. Didn't you have people outside waiting to get in? Oh yeah. They, they're so disorganized. Yeah. No, we had, they turned people away. Yeah. We had the best attendance in all the workshops. Uh, they showed us the numbers, but they still treated us terrible. Mm -hmm. Not even a thank you. Not even a thank you. Think about that for a second. It's a lot of work. Oh, yeah. There's and a, then they treat you like you're, you're a stepchild. Like, yeah. There's a couple of people in our network that are, that are speaking at that thing, and they, they are putting in the work. It's amazing what a commitment that is. And they won't get one client out of it. Like, that's the funny thing. Yeah. Like those people there aren't decision makers. It's mostly middle managers that go to the workshops. Like even the years that we had booths, like you don't really get business out of it. I know the last time that we did it, we didn't, we didn't, yeah. get it. we didn't get one client no. uh, that signed up. But just think about that for a second. We have a bigger bandwidth than NADA. I like it's probably four or five times Right? Like if 6,000 people go to NADA? Yeah. I mean, that's nuts. I never thought about it like that. That's Neither do they. Yeah. <laughs> Next week, I'll be running They're for like, the board at please NADA. Hash, hashtag NADA. Like, you know, it's hilarious. It's great. So, yeah, so I hope that helps. Um, yep. So let's just recap really quick. So, uh, I believe that most loss sales can be tracked to a mistake earlier in the process. You're not in the right frame. They don't see you as a trusted friend, right? Um, we focus too much on product knowledge and not relationship. The timing of everything, like when do they, ha do they have enough time? The earlier in the day, the better chance of sale. Telling a better story with an analogy. Telling the story of clients who finance having finance options up front, not waiting for them to decline or say no, not putting yourself in a situation where you get a no. And, uh, you know, if you're getting a lot of declines, you're not likable. And then what did you call the manager? Henry? Wishy-washy Walter. Wishy-washy <laughs> wishy -washy Walter. It's great. Cool. Well, that was fun. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. We'll see you next time on Service Drive Revolution. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Service Job Revolution. We're uploading new stuff every day, so make sure you subscribe and click the bell icon so you don't miss out. If you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show, 
Call 8333-ASK-SDR and we'll answer your question on the show. That's 8333-ASK-SDR. For special deals on our books and training, head over to offers.chriscollinsinc.com. Now that's offers.chriscollinsinc.com. I'm Chris Collins and I'll see you in the next video.